I'm Michael Medved, the host of Great Minds with Michael Medved. Isn't that clever? And uh, on this podcast from Discovery Institute, I am privileged to have the opportunity to step back from all of the daily headlines and confrontations and confusions that uh, we deal with every day on our nationally syndicated radio show. But on these podcasts of Great Minds with Medved, uh, we're able to consider the most important questions that human beings can confront, including what is it that makes a human exceptional? I, 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 my most recent book was, to some extent, about American exceptionalism. There's lots of talk about that. America's different from other nations. Are human beings different fundamentally from other entities? Now, uh, we're going to speak about that with a, a remarkable thinker uh, and, uh, and, and organizer and academic and also the director of the new Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence. His name is Dr. Robert Marks. Uh, he directs the Discovery Institute's Bradley Center. And nobody is better equipped to address the ultimate question of artificial intelligence versus natural human exceptionalism than Dr. Robert Marx. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Honored okay. to be here. Um, okay. When people talk about human exceptionalism, usually what they think of is, well, human beings are different from animals. We are more intelligent. We're more sentient. But uh, that's not what you're talking about here. There's also a sense that animals are fundamentally different from computers, from machines that we would invent. How are animals different from machine-made machine, machine -made intelligence? Well, that's a very good question, one that I haven't talked about or, or thought about very much. But I do know that uh, a lot of things that happen in the animal world are indeed something that computers can do. Uh, some of them, clearly they can't. We talked about the idea of smelling. I'm not sure if they're sentient. I don't know if they're conscious. I'm not I think I'm conscious. Mm -hmm. Not sure about you. <laughs> we, right. you, know, you, you yeah. You, so you know, you just don't know about some of these things uh, personally. One of the areas that I did research in was swarm intelligence. And one of the things engineers do is they go into the field. They learn about um, they learn about the way that nature works, and they extract algorithms of ways of ways of doing things from nature. And for example, you never think of insects, social insects, as being very smart. But incredibly, even though they're detached, even though individually they're really stupid bugs, they can do incredible things because of their emergent behavior that they're able to do. So that's one of the things that we do study and extract algorithms from. As far as animals in general, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. What uh, Salmon, for instance. I mean, I know that they haven't been trying to figure out how it is they can swim for thousands and thousands of miles and find their way back to spawn to that one little creek that they came from. Is, is that also part of that swarm that behavior you're be, talking about? That would be very interesting. And um, another one that is the monarch butterfly. Yeah. The Discovery put out the very nice uh, picture about and the way they migrate after two or three generations back to the same place. Right, and how is it generationally, the information transmitted generationally from one generation to another? I don't think the research has been done on that, or if it has, it certainly hasn't been reported, and we don't know. So, okay, so so this is the kind of thing uh, you're talking about, their mysteries of the animal. And can, are, are there similar mysteries to the way that computers work? Uh, similar mysteries. Certainly, there's not a lot of things that... Um, there are mysteries about the way things that work. Uh, one of the examples is that you cannot look at a computer program and have another program analyze what it will do. In fact, there's no way that you can know what a computer program will do until you run it. And this is a remarkable result that was pioneered by Alan Turing in the so-called Turing halting problem, which says one computer program cannot analyze another and say whether or not it stops. But it also can analyze another co computer program it, to say whether or not it'll print out the number three. And what is always astonished me about this is the distinction between determinism and knowability. You have your computer program, and the computer program is sitting there. It's deterministic. It's a bunch of line of code. But you don't know what it's going to do uh, in general. Now, there's clearly programs that you can tell what they're going to do if you said, 
print hello world stop yeah you know what that's going to do mm -hmm. but if you can't tell in general what a com complicated uh, or even not complicated computer program could do it's deterministic but it's still not knowable unless you unless you run it so that is pretty mysterious i think okay when you say something is unknowable um what's the difference between something being unknown something you haven't figured out yet, and something being truly unknowable. That is fascinating. There's a field, and it sounds so academic and boring when you hear the name. It's called algorithmic information theory. <laughs> but it is information theory. It's the study of algorithms. And it's it's an entire field uh, founded by three people independently, Chaitin, Kolmogorov, and Solomonov. And in there, you can actually show that there are things which exist or which you would like to do, and you can also prove that they're unknowable. Not that it's, it's not a god of the gaps. It's not a science of the gaps. It isn't an algorithmic of the gaps. It is provably unknowable. And that is, has always been astonishing to me. And I think for people that understand that, the implications in theology and philosophy would just be incredible. But okay, I don't think what, it's explored very much. What, how can something be provably unknowable? I'm, well, I'm, let, me get, let me give you a simple example. Good. <laughs> when, uh, when we take an image and we compress it, we send it over the Internet, but we compress it first. It's like taking food and dehydrating it so that the shipping costs are less, and then we get it to the other end and we rehydrate it. Okay. It, it's the same thing with images. An image is compressed before it's transmitted over the Internet to save bandwidth, and then it's rehydrated, if you will, on the other end. Um, there are lossy ways of doing it. Something called a JPEG compression, for example, is lossy. So you don't get exactly back the same thing on the other side. But there's other ones called PNG or GIF files, which are lossless. You can actually get back the original image, not to a okay. good approximation, but you can get it back exactly. So the question is, how much can that image be compressed? Now, there's some nuances here, but this is the basic concept. It is unknowable how much one can compress an image. Meaning? Meaning that you cannot know if you compress an image a lot whether, it, whether or not it can be compressed more. Now, this is typically applied to computer programs, talking about the shortest computer program to analyze something. It's something called the Kolmogorov complexity, and the Kolmogorov complexity is famously unknowable. Okay. When you talk about un unknowable, can that word be applied to any things outside the world of algorithms and computers? And, and algorithms, again, we're talking about recipes. We're talking about yes. the, the way to complete a task or a task um, and, and the means by completing that task. Would that be, would that be accurate? Yeah, there, there's no way that you can know, yes, once, you, once you've reached that point, yes. Okay. But... Uh, in in the the real world, uh, are are there are there areas of the unknowable that cannot be probed by human intelligence, as opposed to not being probed by uh, computer intelligence or artificial intelligence? That's that, that's an interesting question. Um, the thing is, is that unknowability in the real world is a little bit more difficult to get your hands around. Algorithmically, we can actually look at the mathematics, and through the mathematics, we can show that indeed it's unknowable, and again, that's astonishing. But I always thought, like, the uh, implication, for example, theology was really, really great, that there are things which exist that are unknowable. It's like Plato's dancing people in front of the fire, and you can only see the shadows. Yeah. And so the, the reality of those people dancing behind is unknowable. You'll never know that just by observing the, um, observing the shadows. Okay, what uh, are, are some examples of non-algorithmic tasks that don't fit into uh, the, the parameters of a normal algorithm that human beings can perform that computers can't? Well, I think that there's the obvious one. I don't think computers will ever be spiritual or have a conscience or um, or display sentience. Uh, there are more testable sort of things, such as understanding and creativity and such, that uh, are probably beyond algorithmic understanding in the human being, mm -hmm. and which a computer will never do. What, a, what about the, the idea of, um, I, I mean, computers can learn. Yes. But can they age? 
<laughs> they age. I think they can wear out in the sense that silicon can wear out. Uh, right. So, yeah, only in that sense. But we, we tend to associate age with, with more than just wearing out. In, in, in terms of, if, if you want, spiritual growth. What uh, you're talking about, there's a, a problem with, with uh, trying to understand computers with any form of spirituality as we would, as we would understand it. Well, actually, there's some very interesting propositions now to give computers um, First Amendment rights, <laughs> which I think would be just ludicrous. But there, well, there is a movement to do that. Chimpanzees, that's, that's yeah. actually advancing through yeah. the courts. We've talked about that before. Um, is that advancing through the courts now, chimpanzees? Uh, uh, no, it's been basically thrown out oh, of good, court good, so good. far. But they have a whole center at Harvard, and they have an endowment and... and um, uh, look, this is this is one of those things. People have too much time on their hands. They, they do. <laughs> I yes, mean, I, I agree. I, agree. I, I do think so because the constitutional fathers, it's it's kind of tough to, to say that they were deeply concerned about chimpanzee or bovine rights or rights of any non-human kind. Um, what about, in other words, it, it, one of the interesting things is that in biblical Hebrew, uh, there's a difference between the soul for a human being, which is a nishama, which really has to do with comprehension, and a nefesh, which is for animals, which is a spirit. Yes. And, and human beings have a nefesh too, but o- only human beings have a nishama. What is the core difference that you understand in the Bradley Center for human and artificial intelligence between human intelligence and animal intelligence? Um, one is we can write algorithms. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that they're able to write algorithms. Um, but uh, yeah, well, actually, here's, here's what, what troubled me is that, you know, I think about this all the time because we've lived in the same house for uh, going on 23 years. And uh, okay. Um, there's a whole generation of crows that have grown up near our house. We know that crows are very, very intelligent, but the 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 new generations of crows aren't any smarter than the old generations, right? I mean, yes. they don't they don't seem animals, including the chimpanzees and gorillas and whales and dolphins and parrots and all these various animals that are supposed to be so clever. They don't seem able to gain in terms of the fundamental tasks they can do from generation to generation. Okay. Well, I think in terms of artificial intelligence, um, they can get wiser and wiser and wiser. Uh There is especially a new area, I don't know, the last maybe 15 years, called deep learning, wherein, um, well, the, the fundamental idea has been around, gosh, since the 1960s, wherein you, you give artificial intelligence ex- examples and, f- and the artificial intelligence is actually able to learn from those examples. You would show it, for example, to distinguish between a tree and a bush. This was very, very simple. Mm-hmm. You say, this is a tree, this is a bush, this is a tree, this is a tree. And then after a while, uh, that computer learns that if it's presented a tree, it's going to be a tree. Okay, but this is, you said, get wiser and wiser. Yeah. That I, I would be more and more clever. Uh, is yeah, there, is there... wise, yeah, wise is probably not a good term. No, there wisdom, there, yeah, is, wisdom there isn't is... wisdom, yes. Okay, um, in terms of the ability to create and to, to uh, computer abilities to solve problems yes. are well known. Oh, can, yes. Can computers actually develop the ability to pose problems? Um, no. Okay. In other words, do we have any evidence of um, computers wondering about things, trying no. to figure things out? No, they might query you. Like they, they might say, I need more information or, or something of that sort. But right. as far as any sort of query that is based on creativity, that isn't going to happen. Okay. And, and in terms of being based on creativity, what about that story? I, I remember hearing about it. I think it was NASA that they said that they had a, a computer that had designed some kind of antenna that they used. Yes. Yeah, very interesting uh, example. They use something called evolutionary computing, which is something that I do. And the idea was they applied Darwinian evolution to the design of this antenna 
They came up with a design that looked like a bent paper clip stuck in a cork, but it, but it ran very well and was actually deployed to outer space. However, the reality is that, first of all, there was an end result that these engineers wanted, and it was called the specification for the design, if you will. And they placed a fitness, and they used this powerful electromagnetic software to simulate fields in order to make sure that the antenna received it correctly. So the basic idea, and this, this happens a lot in artificial intelligence in terms of search, is that the programmer will go in and they will put out a field of billions and trillions of different solutions. They're not sure what the consequence of those solutions are going to be, but they put out billions and trillions of solutions, and the question is, uh, how do you wade through these solutions in a smart way? Because you don't have time to do them all, but you have to wade through them in order to find out uh, an example which is a good one. And sometimes those examples are surprising, mm -hmm. but they're not creative because all, that's already been placed out there by the computer programmer. Okay, what what about the, um, in other words, it, the, the old Frankenstein uh, myth uh, is is the human being creating a monster in his own image. To to what extent can we create artificial intelligence with human characteristics? Well, this is something that is referred to as artificial general intelligence. Most artificial intelligence today is relatively focused. In other words, they look at a specific problem. And they analyze that problem. It's very narrow. It's like yeah, looking how through you, a pipe. Yeah, how do you get a car that's going to take people from exactly, place to place? Exactly, exactly. And, and so they'll, they'll get that, right? And I, th I think that they will when, when they decide when it's okay to kill a certain number of people. <laughs> I, I mean, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you mean? Well, the question is: is when you when you build an art when you build a car, which is self driving, um, it, there's going to be contingencies which are not anticipated. I went to a talk where the guy said, that, I won't mention the name of the company, but he, they were driving around the self-driving car, and it was really great until a plastic bag flew across the front of the car, and the car didn't know what to do. It was a contingency that they didn't plan on. So uh, there will always be contingencies, I believe, that the designer of the self-driving car didn't, uh, didn't anticipate. Uh -huh. And the question is, if you get that an order of magnitude below people killing people, then, you know, that might be acceptable. Mm -hmm. Right. But, so that, that's, that's the But presumably premise. that should be because human beings don't always respond in a rational or effective way to a paper bag blowing across that's the That's true. Either. That's true, too. Um, okay. Uh, just to bring us back here for a moment, uh, the very essence of human exceptionalism. What can human beings do that even the most uh, de well-designed and sophisticated computer systems, artificial intelligence, do? I would say that the thing that really stands out is creativity uh, that, that, that we've talked about. The ability to actually do something that is against the accumulated knowledge that sits, say, in computer memory and do something external to that. In fact, in order to do something creative, you have to abandon that and do something which is brand new. And I think that uh, creativity is something that computers will never do. You'll get surprising results, you'll get unexpected results, but you'll never get creativity. What about uh, reproducing and reproducing themselves or other machines on a higher order? That, well, I don't believe it's going to be in a higher order. There was a great scientist named John von Neumann who was wondering about colonization of Mars. Right. And he said, I, we're, we need to spend a, send a spacecraft there that, in, that incorporates the natural resources that builds other robots. And these other robots are going to build other robots and they're going to build a nice, nice place for astronauts to live when they get there. And this is all going to be done with artificial intelligence. And he actually looked at this idea of self-replicating robots. And if you do have the self-replication, you cannot, I, I, I don't see there's a way to get out anything which is creative or more intelligence than the programmer and the original computer program. Uh, speaking to Professor Robert Marks, and thank you, Dr. Marks, for very effectively Countering that uh, media myth that humans are not exceptional, that we're basically uh, flesh-covered machines, maybe a little bit more. Uh, if you enjoyed the exchange as much as I did, 
uh, then please check out this show's website at mindswithmedved.com. There's lots more information about Bob Marks. By the way, you, you'll be dazzled and amazed to just read about his background and his achievements. No machine could do it. And uh, the, uh, you'll also learn about the Bradley Center, which is a reflection of creative endeavor by Discovery Institute. And while you're there, be sure to hit the uh, special button. You're now programmed to do that. It's a button that says Donate. That helps keep wonderful conversations like this one going strong. And, and please also subscribe so you won't miss a single future episode of Great Minds with Michael Medved. That's a free service of Discovery Institute. Go to mindswithmedved.com. And thank you.